25 before the hour. Concluding now the uh, article by uh, the uh, the professor, assistant professor of political science at Drexel and the Ph.D. candidate in sociology, uh, sociology at UC Santa Cruz, entitled The Execution of Christopher Dorner. Dorner was not a radical, but his short war was not simply the story of a broken man or of individualistic vengeance. The issues of brutality and racism perpetually covered up by a corrupt police department created the insurgent Dorner and resonated with many people who endure the reality of urban policing on a daily basis. The sympathy and the support Dorner received is a clear indicator of the very real and very deep structural inequalities that helped forge the path of Dorner's life and his fiery death. The great radical historian Mike Davis concluded a recent article on Dorner with the peculiar question, quote, Does anyone cheer Dorner? End quote. What is peculiar is that, for better or worse, there's no denying that the answer is, Yes, there's no telling what sort of a fire they could start tomorrow. And again, the two authors, George uh, Sicurello Marr is an assistant professor of political science at Drexel University. He is an author and blah, blah, blah. Mike King is a Ph.D. candidate in sociology at UC Santa Cruz. Both study policing and counterinsurgency. The uh, the entire story of Christopher Dorner is, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to be flip or cavalier here uh, with the choice of the word intriguing, but but it is. It's also very involving, uh, emotionally involving. An entirely different way, but as involving to me emotionally. Well, not as involving, but to a degree, a lesser degree, but to a degree, as some of the mass shootings that have occurred around the country. The one that I separate completely, exclude from any kind of comparison, is the shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. To me, those shootings were an example of unique madness and pain. In this country, I understand, I understand how many people are killed by our drones and our pilotless aircraft and and on and on and on. I'm talking about here in this country, if you don't mind. But the story of Christopher Dorner, I I don't think that entire story has been, uh, the, the true story has been written yet. At all, and and I think there is an, a mighty PR effort underway right now to um, first of all, um, and, and and again, I, I'm I'm not all that carefully choosing words here, so pick them apart if you will, but I think there is an effort underway right now to absolve the L.A. Police Department and the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department and anyone else who is involved. Uh, in what these two authors call the execution of Christopher Dorner, there's an effort to paint these policing agencies as uh, being reactive to the, the crime spree in the presence of this mass killer. And <clears throat> I think there's also an attempt being made to show that he did not, he was not burned to death uh, deliberately by any means, that he committed suicide. Um, which he may have, but but the two don't nece- aren't necessarily connected. The plan may have been to, and and it seems like it was, according to reports from the police scanners, the plan may have been to completely uh, engulf him in flames. And if Christopher Dorner, at any point, under any sort of motivation, whether it was. Uh, um, realizing he was a dead man anyway, or realizing that he was going to be uh, taken into custody or, or, or whatever, 
or perhaps realizing he didn't want to burn to death. He may have committed suicide, but that is irrelevant, isn't it, to the plan to execute him in that cabin. Now, I'm, I am, am not, by any means, do I understand uh, the tactical uh, or strategic responses by police departments to something like this event. And I can only draw on my own personal experience of, of, as observer. Uh, I've never been involved in that kind of, of police violence. I have witnessed some of it. But <clears throat> observing, and, and there's enough video out to show you absolute and utter brutality on the part of police, especially where it concerns civil disobedience, the kind of reaction to uh, the Occupy demonstrations, uh, the kind of reactions in this country to peaceful protests, the full militarization now of, of local police departments all the way down to, you know, little jerkwater communities that have 10 officers uh, on the police force. Four of them are going to be special weapons and tactics, and they're going to have a great big goddamn uh, armored personnel car uh, uh, carrier, and they're also going to have all the accoutrement that you see them dress up in before they bring in the SWAT team. It happens in the Atlanta area here at least once a week. Some crazy son of a bitch will, will get in a fight with a boyfriend or girlfriend uh, the boyfriend or girlfriend will flee and, and, and the freak will be in the house and uh, the boyfriend or girlfriend will scream to the police, he's got a gun, she's got a gun. And then here they come. Here they come. Holy Christ, it's as if we had been invaded by Martians. Here they come. Armored personnel carriers, bazookas, hand grenades, people wearing canteens, for Christ's sake, flamethrowers, uh, fully automatic assault rifles, because some freak is inside a little clapboard house uh, in one of the neighborhoods in Atlanta, and he or she has a forty five caliber handgun. Right? And overarching all of this, of course, is the understanding, whether you support it or resist it. And a lot of people in this country support it. Overarching all of this is the use and expanding use of pilotless aircraft to... I, I don't. Again, I'm, I'm I'm just talking here, but to execute people that are determined to be a threat to us. Now, how that determination's made, who makes it, uh, yada yada yada. Uh, you know, we've been talking about this for the past week or two. Who knows? Does the actual Barack Obama sit there? Does he kiss his girls goodnight and then go into his office with a list of people to be executed with a drone or a pilotless aircraft? Is that how it works? That's a little bit bizarre, isn't it, to imagine that? So it, I'm guessing it's not like that. I mean, some on the extreme left are painting it that way. I, I just don't happen to agree with that. However, it has been made very clear to us that there is some sort of selection process being conducted that determines people who are going to be blown into red mist eventually with a pilotless aircraft somewhere on Earth. So who's doing it? And why is it being done? And why is there so goddamn much secrecy? What is going on here? Well, you know what's going on. Come on, Mike. Don't sit here and, you know, act all surprised. We no longer live in a democratic republic. It is gone. It has been gone. And I think the final knife into the body was uh, uh, the Bush crime family. Their illegal ascension to power, and then, of course, the takeover by these neoconservatives who d determined now's our moment. Let's just bring the whole goddamn thing crashing down. And in a sense, they certainly did, didn't they? But overarching all this, like I said, is this murderous policy that is now official. It's official policy. 
It's not some clandestine operation by a bunch of spooks running around with, uh, uh, you know, in the shadows. It's right out in the open. Now, there are other things that are occurring in the shadows, but assassination, execution, extrajudicially against anyone, anyone, anywhere that somebody in this government or this country or this establishment or someplace is determining uh, determining to be a threat to what? To you, me, New York, Miami, what? A threat to what? I don't have the answer. 